This is Legislative Review on Prairie Public. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Our guest this week is the chairman of the House Education Committee, Representative Mike Nathy of Bismarck. Representative, thanks for being here. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yes, and as we tape this, you've had an interesting debate and a very long debate for House floor purposes. It had to be over the Common Core and the bill to withdraw from Common Core. Give us your perspective about that bill. Well, as you, as you know, Dave, it's a, it's a very emotional issue on, on both sides, and this has been going on here in North Dakota, really, quite frankly, since the end of the previous session. So really for almost two years this has been going on, and there's been a lot of debate uh, out in the public in the town hall meetings and private meetings between the uh, education side of people and, and, and the, the parents who are concerned about this. And, um, you know, I always knew once we got into the session we would have a professional hearing that would be held with uh, respect and dignity and, and was about a week ago Monday. Everybody on both sides did a great job. And uh, it moved to the floor this week. And we, it, we held it for a little bit. We had to wait for some people to get in who wanted to weigh in on, on the debate. And uh, had a debate yesterday, as you know. And uh, it was quite spirited. And um, the, the part that we had to separate out, especially in our committee, in the committee that I chair, we had to figure out fact from fiction. And I think both sides, things get a little gray on each side, so we had to figure that out. And, and after we had heard it, and, and we heard the testimony, we heard it, we discussed it in a committee a couple of days later, we came out with a 9-4 do not pass, and then went up to the House. And uh, had quite a debate yesterday for about an hour and a half, two hours on that. And uh, as you know, the... Uh, uh, there were some uh, dr uh, dramatics. We had a, what they call the minority report, which means three people on my committee did not agree with the co committee recommendation. They agreed to have their own separate report and have those amendments heard. And uh, in the meantime, when we were getting ready for the vote and the discussion yesterday, at the last second, they pulled that minority report and then just wanted to take one section out of the eight sections in the bill. So they were willing to forego the other seven sections, but wanted to have the debate on the one section, which was withdrawing North Dakota from the Smarter Balance Consortium, the testing. And uh, so we debated that at length and then had some side debate as far as standards and those sorts of things. And, and uh, that amendment passed. That discussion, excuse me, that discussion, uh, uh, the motion, the Division A, as they call it, uh, failed. And after that, Division B was taken up, which was the remainder of the bill, and that failed uh, overwhelmingly. I think it was 89-0 or 90-0. So um, I'm sure, Dave, that does not end the debate. There will be plenty of debate between now. Uh, but, you know, the education community now has a couple years to uh, show us what, what the standards are going to do. And they have some time to, to prove to North Dakota this is what we're talking about. And now we're expecting to see some results when we come back here next session. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I noticed you said it was sometimes a little difficult for people to separate fact from fiction. And is that a case that the people who are supporting Common Core may need to do a better job of selling it? Uh, actually, I think both sides. I think, I think the communication needs to improve on both sides of it. And I think they need to tone down the rhetoric. And, and I think people who are against Common Core, I think their, their objectives are noble. I think the majority of the people have uh, uh, a, a, a good idea of what they want. Um, but unfortunately, like any other group, there's always that little radical part that kind of oversees them, overtakes what they want to do. So, yeah, I think communications on their side, on the education side too, they need to better uh, communicate what they want, what we can expect uh, uh, from them as North Dakotans and how it will improve our system. So um, I think they were a little behind on the ball on that. They kind of caught up as we got close to session. Um, but uh, the word got out from the, the schools, the, the vast majority of the teachers, that they supported this. And then the word got out as far as how well things were doing. We didn't hear that a, a year ago from the schools. They were kind of sitting back, laying in wait. But as we got uh, into session, we started hearing those stories. And I think that definitely added to the debate. What, I'm, what I heard this today was that there might be a study resolution to study smarter balance for a couple of years, let the legislature and the public weigh in on it. Uh, is that in the plans or in the works somewhere? Uh, to be honest with you, Dave, I, I don't know right now. I, I've heard some talk of that, but you know how those things go. There's a lot of talk and a lot of uh, speculation up there. So, you know, right now we just we got through the debate yesterday. There was some talk today on the floor that they might bring the bill back. And uh, really, quite frankly, up until the time we gaveled in this afternoon, and uh, they found out they did not have the votes to bring the bill back. So the bill is officially officially failed. So, But as far as a, any study resolution, those are something that uh, I'm sure will be discussed as we go forward, and uh, quite frankly, will probably be discussed during the interim. I kind of hesitate to ask this because one part of the bill did interest me a lot. It's a, it talked about what, what looked like almost taking all of the authority away from the superintendent of public instruction. Is there some resentment or some anger 
toward well, the superintendent? Well, you know, until they pulled the uh, division reports, that was going to be part of my speech yesterday. And I was going to ask, you know, when did the, re, the uh, discussion go from standards and testing to veering over to, uh, to attacking the superintendent position of DPI? And, and uh, I, I don't know, to quite honestly, I don't know why it went that way. I know there, that was the reason why a lot of legislators did not support the bill. They were very uncomfortable with that, uh, with that part of the bill. So uh, to answer your question, I really don't know why it veered into that. Um, I think, quite frankly, it hurt the debate. I think it took the, it took the focus off of what the people who are, don't, do not like Common Core wanted to talk about. Now let's get into the, probably the bigger issue and probably one of the biggest issues in the session, and that's funding for K-12 schools. Where is the legislature at right now, given the fact of some of the uncertainties about oil revenue? It doesn't directly affect schools, but then again, you've got the property tax relief yes. that comes through yep. education. So where are we at? Well, you know, it, the Senate has the K-12 funding bill right now, and I know it's going through appropriations as we speak. Uh, the K-12 bill is around $1.8 billion, and um, it's my belief that we will always, con and we will fund K-12 to the point that we need it to be funded. Even if we have a tough revenue picture where we're looking at revenue numbers coming down, one of the, uh, one of the uh, departments we are not going to touch will be K-12. We will always fund that because North Dakotans overwhelmingly support K-12 in this state. As you heard I say, said yesterday on the floor, 80 percent of North Dakotans support K-12, the highest rating in any other state in the country. So that's priority number one. We always will have enough funding there. Um, in the interim, there was uh, a recommendation of 3.6 percent growth in the first year of the biennium and the second year of the biennium. Um, the main reason is we're looking at a, an additional 8,000 8, to 13,000 new students possibly joining uh, the K-12 ranks in North Dakota, which is a great problem to have. When I came in, in 2009, one of the things we heard was we're, we, our schools are emptying out and our the West is, it needs help out there and all these sorts of things. Now we're here we are five, six years later, and now we have the, the challenge of what do we do with these schools? They're, you know, they're burgeoning with kids and they have to add all this sort of stuff. So, so the main increase in K-12 funding is the number of students coming. Now, one thing I don't think some people are thinking about is with the slowdown in the West and some of these people moving back home down south, taking maybe their family with them. So that may slow down that increase. But I think the increase in students statewide, uh, you will see it keep jumping up. So. But the legislature will always be there to adequately fund K-12, and we always have stepped up to the plate with that. Yeah, you did talk about that, and that it's almost kind of a moving target about how many students are going to be yes. in schools. And with, with the potential slowdown in the West, well, that adds some uncertainty to the whole thing. Yes, it will. So, you know, you, as you know, the revenue picture is fluid, and we're going to get some uh, up-to-date numbers in March. And, uh, and I think we'll also find out maybe where, where some of the uh, enrollment trends are going, too, as we, as we move forward for next year. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, we have a lot of challenges when it comes to the money and to come to funding uh, programs right now. Now, you weren't in the, the session in 1982, when, no. or in, 19, in the early 80s. In 1982, the Governor Olson had to do an allocation because of uh, oil prices falling just below, I think, $5 a barrel at one point. Yeah. And he had to cut across the board. That's all the power he had. $45 million was cut from elementary secondary education. Eventually that led to the Foundation Aid Stabilization mm -hmm. Fund. And yep. so your, your comments about funding K-12 education was like a top priority do ring true. Yes, and uh, you know uh, the Common Schools Trust Fund is, is growing by leaps and bounds and I believe it's throwing off 225, 230 million dollars. That will have help offset a lot of that growth in spending for K-12 and then the Foundation Aid Stabilization, Stabilization Fund is also growing by leaps and bounds. So there are some revenue streams that will help us fund K-12 as we keep going forward and, and look forward to the, uh, the Legacy Fund debate uh, quite honestly next session. You know what are we going to do with some of that and we have to have that debate and figure out what we're going to do. We're going to give that help with K-12 students, help with higher ed students, those sorts of people. And believe me, as you know, there is no shortage of any ideas what to do with that fund. So, But your Senate Majority Leader Rich Wardner has said, yes, the legacy fund could be used to help fund K-12 if needed. Correct, correct. So it's always there. So we'd have basically three funding three funding revenue sources to uh, to help keep that going. So, And I cannot stress enough, uh, K-12 is, is one of the top priorities in the, in the legislature for both parties. And uh, we, you know, we have an obligation, according to the Constitution, to provide an education for every child in the state. And we will do that, and we'll do it with proper funding. It's interesting that North Dakota is in a very good position. Yes, there is concern about oil revenues, but with the, the, the things North Dakota has built, the legislature has built, 
K-12 education is fairly protected. Yeah, it's fairly protective right now. And, you know, I know the legislative, legislative bodies in the past, and in the press, we get criticized a little bit for putting too much money in these certain in certain categories and kind of uh, putting money aside. But you see the the fruits right now of that happening from the previous previous legislators that, that went ahead and did this. We are That is starting to pay off right now and, quite honestly, helping to uh, ease that a little bit for us. What are some of the other th things that you see for funding priorities uh, for education. I know there's a lot of talk about pre-K and kindergarten education. Yes, there's a early childhood bill over in the Senate right now. Um, it's uh, it's a bill that would pay. Uh, uh, it's it would follow the child to the early to the early childhood uh, school that they would use. Fifteen hundred dollars for that. It's a thousand dollars for a child. Excuse me. Fifteen hundred dollars for a child who may be on free and reduced meals program, and. Uh, that is not for their children are not required to go there. But if the communities, the, the private sector, get together and say, "Hey, we need to do have an early childhood program," they can get together, develop a program, and the state will then help offset some of those costs and pay per child as they go through that program. Mm -hmm. And when we and we noticed last session, um, quite a few of the districts were using their own money for these sorts of uh, sorts of programs. And it wasn't we didn't know if it was legal or not. So we did pass a bill in the law last session to let the local school districts use their own money to pay for these early childhood programs. And we saw the number of districts uh, go up 50, 60 percent that took, a, a, took advantage of this. We had an early childhood study that came back and said there's a definite need in the state for it. And this bill is as a result of that, uh, as of that study. And uh, I think it got great support in the Senate. I think that's also in the Senate appropriations right now. And uh, it's going to get good support in the House too. It's not to the level some people wanted it to be. No, but, but like anything else, you know, we need to start someplace, and uh, we can build it up. We can build it up from there. I think the bill is roughly six million dollars, and uh, so we need to run this for pass the bill, run it for a biennium, see how it's working. We can tweak it, adjust it as we go along, and uh, decide next session what we want to do. Well, your committee also has some funding bills that have to go to House appropriations, too, yes. correct? Yes, yes, we do. We have uh, there's a bill in there for a uh, uh, enrollment bill at, at a tune of sixty seven million dollars, and uh, with the revenue picture we have right now, that might be kind of tough. But that they're going to be looking at that. Uh, another bill looking at helping some of the oil patch schools uh, with their. Uh, uh, being able to pay for their, their school school loans and helping with their oil money that they're getting. It's a complicated formula, but uh, kind of tweaking some of those sorts of things. Uh, we're looking at for some more money for STEM courses and uh, increasing that, and that came out of the Higher Ed Education Funding uh, Committee uh, in the interim. So, uh, And there's a lot of support for that. I think that was about maybe an 8 or $9 million increase over it for a total of about $30-some million, $35 million. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so we have a lot of programs that, again, it, it's as a result of the growth in students that we have, and quite frankly, we need to raise our game in some of these categories, and uh, we're having those discussions right now to do that. Yeah, not to put too fine a point on that, the higher education's talked about all these remedial courses, too. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and we have a remediation issue in this state, quite honestly. Uh, I think it's around 35, 40 percent of children that go to higher ed need to have remediation. That was one of the one of the debates in the Common Core issue is we need to raise that bar for the students and challenge our kids more than what they have today and also raise the accountability for the teachers to make sure they are reaching that bar. And uh, that comes at the request of not only higher ed, seeing the remediation rates that we have, but also from private industry who says, hey, we need to have these kids graduate from school, graduate from higher ed. We need these, these students in these high professional, high, um, high technology jobs to help fill our jobs out west. So it all kind of goes hand in hand when you take a look at it. I know that that's the interesting coalition that supported Common Core. You had teachers, administrators, school boards, and business yes. and others yep. that supported Common Core. Yes, yes. So, and, and again, I, I think it's early in the game. My position has been it's we're only in the second year of, of Common Core. Uh, let's give it a chance. But like I said earlier, they'll have a biennium now to prove themselves, and we're hoping to see some success with that. So, Now to go back to the bill that you're talking about, enrollment, that, that's for... Uh, real enrollment pressure for a, for a school district like a West Fargo or a Watford City or a Williston that's seeing growth in enrollment. Correct, correct. So it would pay any school in any school in the state that has an in increased enrollment of even one child. And and that's where the policy debate is. Do, do we do that or should the schools shoulder some of the increase themselves and then the state step in to help them? There is a, what we call a rapid enrollment bill for about $14.5 million dollars for any school that uh, experiences a student increase of 2.5% or more. So the bar is pretty low. Uh, last session, I think it was around 4%. So we lowered that bar to include more schools with rapid enrollment. So, so there is money there if they find themselves in, reven in a revenue tight spot. The state will have some money there to help them get over that hump. Now, I, I wanted to ask this question because it's the interesting debate, and not necessarily a debate, but 
a lot of property tax relief is tied to education funding. Yes. And Representative Carlson made the point on the floor during one of the debates on that renter's credit that you shouldn't talk about it as property tax relief. Let's talk about education funding. As the head of the Education Committee, does that make you a little nervous? Well, Dave, if you remember last session, uh, House Bill 1319, which was the K-12 funding bill, which was the main reason why we went till the 80th day and <laughs> 5 o'clock in the morning, I was the prime sponsor of that bill and right in the middle of that storm, quite honestly. So it doesn't make me nervous, but it's a commitment that we've made as a state that we will step up and fund 80% of the funding. Uh, for for, kid, for the the schools in this state, you know, when I get when I got in '09, I think the state funding was around 45 percent somewhere in that area. We were being criticized because we didn't get enough money to schools. Well, here we are six years later, and we're at 80 percent. So again, schools is is the one area that we do control, and again, we're we're obligated by the Constitution per, to provide an education. So we can control that when it comes to property tax relief. My frustration with property tax relief is we send money to the law, uh, to the counties, to the cities and only to watch that get spent away and not really get passed along. With the schools, with the K-12 funding bill, we tightened the screws where we said we lowered the mills and said here's the cap, we're sending you the money and we fully expect you to pass it along. And if they go above the cap, they have to take it to the vote of the people. So, the, and to the school's credit, they pass that, uh, that money along. If you notice the first year of the last biennium, uh, Fargo, I think, was an average of 25% uh, uh, reduction in property taxes because of the schools. Uh, Bismarck here in town was around 20, 19 or 20%. So we saw it around the state. Second year the biennium, the, the reduction was a little less. You're not going to get 20% every year. But uh, it, it turned out to be very, uh, very effective, a much more effective way than we had done in the previous uh, sessions when it came to property tax. Now, during the interim, that you had talked about trying to find the true cost of what it, of what it takes to educate a child. Have you come up with that, that number yet? Well, I think that number is always moving, and, and that's one of the other frustrations. You talk to the schools, and, and their intentions are good, and they'll give us one number, and we, and we in the legislature, well, according to our numbers, it's this number. So we're trying to, we're trying to work that out. And There's a bill still left in my committee uh, having to do with ending fund balances for schools. And it goes back to property tax. And uh, the average ending fund balance, which is a savings account, uh, if you're, for your viewers to understand, is uh, about 23%. And it comes to a, to a total of about a little over $300 million between the whole, all 181 uh, districts. Part of the issue that we had is when we did send the money to, to the schools, we saw some school districts with very large ending fund balances only turn around and have very large increases in their budgets and then turn around and, and uh, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases turn around and then pass that large increase on to the taxpayer, all the while not touching this big pile of money that they had in any fund balance. So we've been trying to shine some light on that and that kind of ties in your question as far as what does it cost, mm -hmm. how much do they really need to have an ending fund balance. So we took a look at that. Uh, there's, there's still going to be some more discussion on that, but that bill will be coming to the floor, I'd imagine, here in about a week or so. And we're still working with the education community to find out what works, what doesn't, and I'm, we're not looking to hurt the schools or make their life any harder than it is because they have a very big job and a very big challenge. But we also need to be fair to the taxpayer too and to make sure that they're using that money properly. And if, if they don't need it, then they make sure they give it back to the taxpayer in a form of relief. So if you had your druthers, what would be a target for an ending fund balance? Well, uh, you, during the testimony that we heard, a lot of the larger schools around that 15%, 12 to 15% range. Uh, some of the smaller schools, you know, 15% doesn't equate to that much money. So uh, I think we're looking in, that, in, in the teens, between 15 to 20% somewhere in that area, and, and those are things that we're working on right now. Is that, could that be a tiered thing? You know, we talked about a tiered thing, but there comes, to, there comes into question of uh, equality. You have to be equitable across the board. So uh, probably, not, probably not the tiered system. We'll, we'll work off the system we have now. It's just a matter of figuring out the dollar amounts and the percentages and to make sure it works for everybody. Now, since we talked about K-12 education almost being, you're going to fund it. Because yes. Because you've got the money and we're going to fund it. Is there any thought you know, have you talked to your appropriators about contingencies? Uh, no, we haven't. And again, those are discussions I will probably get uh, the second half once I, we get the K-12 bill in the House. Um, there are some things we'll need to take a look at as far as, you know, whenever you draw a line and you say, well, if you go below this certain percentage and you get this amount of money, there's always somebody on the wrong side of the fence. And we, so we need to take a hard look at, at some of that. But uh, I haven't had those discussions yet. Again, that's all over in the Senate right now. So, but we will have those, those discussions after crossover. 
So how many bills do you have left in the committee? Now? In our committee, we have, uh, we have three bills to, that we've already heard that, we're gonna, that we will move out next week, and then we have one hearing on Tuesday because the prime sponsor had somebody coming in, couldn't make it till next Tuesday. So we will be done, uh, my estimation, by Tuesday afternoon. Any big issues still? Uh, not really, no. Uh, the ending fund balance is the one. Uh, there was one for uh, parental directives, whether they would have their, their children would have to take a test or not. Uh, we're working on that. And uh, other than that, there's really nothing else. So we've kind of moved all the big ones. You know, as, as chairman, I'm under a timeline, a time constraint, quite frankly, to get money bills, the bills with money in it, out by a certain date so they can get to appropriations and they can and they can go through that. And that's something I have to do later on this afternoon to set up in front of the uh, uh, the full appropriations committee and explain the the education bills that have money in it and tell them why we passed it and explain the bills to them. And as you know, that can be quite an exercise sometimes. So. <laughs> well, appropriators are looking for every dollar, every nickel, and, and to make sure yeah. things are spent correctly. Yeah, and you know, it's a much different session this now than, than the money. I think the last the last two sessions, uh, that you know, was kind of the gravy train. We didn't say no to a whole lot of things. This session, we have to learn to say no. And I look at a lot uh, some legislators who are much more veteran than I. This reminds them of some of the years past, saying you have to be able to say no. And I have the, uh, I've had the, the benefit, at least my first session, it was that way. Um, so uh, it's much tighter now. It's, and the attitudes are changing. But I think as we see as the session goes, there's going to be more urgency and more. We're going to have to make some very, very tough decisions. And we, we're not quite there yet because we don't know the final numbers. But it's, we're going to have to make some very tough decisions. And, uh, and the public's going to have to know and be uh, well-versed on what we're doing to know what's going on. So let's get, just for a second talk about the parallels you see between 09 and 15. Well, again, in 09, like I said earlier, uh, we had schools we had schools ramping out. Uh, out West needs economic development. We had uh, people leaving the state in droves. Uh, I remember um, uh, the late Senator Bob Stengem, who was my senator and a good friend of mine, was very happy. I think they had a 30 or $40 million ending fund balance. That's all we had left in there. I mean, today's, today it would just seem like a pittance, but back then mm -hmm. that was quite monumental. And uh, he was thrilled beyond belief that we had that kind of money left in the bank. Uh, fast forward to today, we have people coming here in droves. We have schools that are bursting at the seams. Uh, we have people out in the West saying, you know, we need to slow this down now because we, we can't catch up. So it's one of those things, watch out what you wish for mm -hmm. because all of a sudden they're all rolling in. And then we're looking at huge ending fund balances. You know, we're talking billions of dollars, or we have in the past at least, with, uh, with, with a surplus. So uh, it has been truly night and day. And uh, I've had the, the uh, honor, quite honestly, to be on both ends of that spectrum. And uh, it's been, I've always told my friends, I said, I'm a very lucky guy when it comes to being a legislator. I picked a pretty darn good time to just get into it. So, uh, um, but it's a whole other set of challenges, as you know, when you're a legislator and you have no money, the old saying goes, it's much easier to say no. When you have money, you have a lot more people asking you for that. I have to go into one money issue, and that's the surge bill, which was heard in the House, the House Committee this week. Yeah. It's not ready for prime time just yet. How do you feel about the surge funding bill? Well, I, we'll definitely be uh, funding more money out, out west, and we need to take a look at, at their projects and what they need to do. But there's definitely the desire within the legislature and in either both chambers that we need to ad adequately fund the west and make sure we do the build out and get all this, uh, all this done for them. So uh, there's a lot of support for it. But again, we're, we might be in some tight ref, uh, revenue constraints, and we have to make sure we're not overextending ourselves because we need to make sure we have money also going into the next session for the property tax relief that we want to do and fund education and all those sorts of things that are also on our, on our docket too. Could it be a, a fair statement to say that the March revenue forecast is even more important this year? Yes, I think, I think it is paramount important. I had heard on... on uh, Radio the other day, I think we're down to 125, 130 rigs uh, with a prediction that we may be down in the 80 to 100 rigs. Now, some of the numbers I saw earlier were based on 135 rigs. So if that all comes true and if oil stays low or, and it keeps dropping, it's going to be a much more perilous revenue picture to deal with. And that is something we as legislators, legislators will have to get out and explain to the public, hey, we don't have as much as we had to do. And unfortunately, we're going to have to make some tough decisions and, and, and go from there. So and that's where we have to fund our priorities and decide what is the most important and then go down the list. And definitely, again, education's up there. The surge bill taking care of the West is up there. Uh, Fargo uh, taking care of Fargo, the flood protection. We've had that debate here the last couple of days on the floor. So um, those are all kinds of sorts of things we need to really take a good hard look at. 
contingency again that maybe some contingencies could be built into some of the budgets? Yes, and that's kind of where the uh, wizardry, uh, you could say, of the appropriations come in, where, 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 the, where the veterans who know what they're doing, they, they have a, the foresight and the experience to say, hey, we can fund this, but let's put some money over here in this, in this column over here to make sure we have that so we don't short ourselves for the next session. So, Given what you're dealing with, is it time to look at annual sessions? You know, I've uh, a friend of mine in the legislature in the legislature just loves it. I, I am not really for one, and, and and the main reason is I think we would not get the quality of candidates and the quality of legislators to do that. It is tough to do it every other year. I live here in Bismarck, and it's still it's it's the challenge for me for my family with my young family and my business. And I'm afraid if we go every year for even two three months, there's a lot of people that would not be able to get work off, and quite honestly, with family too, with growing families. So um, I think we can do what we can do. Uh, I, my prediction is we'll be done in less than 80 days. So, um, I was going to ask you about that. There's a lot of talk about trying to trying to keep it to 75 days to save a few days yes. in case you need them. Yep, and I think we do need them because, again, with the fluctuating oil pitcher and the revenue pitcher, we definitely need them. And if you take a look, we were just told the other day uh, out of the House bills, I think we've... Uh, 40-some percent of the bills have been killed that were filed in the House, which is good because if they're a bad bill, you kill bad bills. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, yes, I think we're going to get there. I think there's definitely the, uh, the momentum to, to save those days. So it's, uh, we, And we can do it. We can certainly do it. Very good. Thanks for being here. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. I enjoyed it. Our guest today on Legislative Review, the head of, House Appropri uh, the, head of How the House Education Committee, Representative Mike Nathie of Bismarck. For Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson.